Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for uh, bearing with us here, folks. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. My name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, joined by my colleague, Kyle Dalton, who is the Membership and Development Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Welcome, Kyle. Hey, thanks for, uh, for hosting. Uh, it's great to be with uh, all of you folks today on, uh, at least at the time we're, we're doing this, is a very snowy day uh, out here in, uh, in, well, I'm in West Virginia, just right near Harper's Ferry, Kyle's in Frederick, uh, where the museum is. And today we're going to be talking about uh, U.S. Navy and Marine casualties, which promises to be a, a very exciting program. Uh, Kyle is our expert that we've brought in here today. Uh, he wrote a, a great series of articles on the website on this very subject. So uh, promises to be a really engaging conversation today. Hope everyone out there enjoys. I uh, see we got a few people already commenting, uh, Rick and Barbara uh, saying hello and happy new year. Uh, yes, this is the first stream of the new year for, uh, for us. So we're uh, glad to be back with you all in 2022. Um, if you like our videos and you enjoy them, one of the best ways to support us it's easy and free for everyone. Just hit that like button uh, or give a, a little heart or you know whatever whatever type of emoji that that you feel best describes uh, about this, uh, how you feel about our, our videos. Uh, do that and then share the videos to your friends or groups you're in or, or whatever. Um, that's an easy free way to support us. Uh, and if you want to take your support just one more level up, uh, Kyle will uh, tell you about one of our ongoing projects that we're working on. Yeah, uh, ever since uh, November last year, we've been raising money to restore a reproduction ambulance wagon. We've had this wagon for almost a decade uh, at our Pry Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield. And it's a valuable hands-on tool because it's a reproduction, because it's not an original, uh, kids can climb into it, students can examine it, uh, we can use it. We've rolled it out for special events uh, in, in areas uh, around uh, Maryland. Uh, it's a very valuable tool for us, but it has been a decade. Uh, and it does need a little bit of work so that we can continue to use it as a educational instrument. Uh, that means that we have to send it to a wagon repair guy. And as you might imagine, there's not that many of them. <laughs> so we've got to ship it out there. Uh, we have to have specialized workmen uh, work on it. Not only are they promising to restore it, uh, to bring it back to working condition, they're also going to make it more accurate. The ambulance wagon that we have is a, a slightly smaller scale Rucker style ambulance wagon. And it's missing a few of the key pieces that would make it that. Uh, it needs to be repainted. The wheels need to be replaced. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. If you like what you see, you want to support us, please consider uh, doing that. Consider giving towards our appeal uh, to restore this ambulance wagon. There will be a link in the comments or in the description. Uh, this is our first time back at Facebook in a long time. Uh, usually we stream to YouTube. Uh, so we're still kind of working out the kinks here, but there will be a link somewhere that you can click on uh, to help. Uh, otherwise, visit us at civilwarmed.org. Uh, and uh, click that support button, that's gonna help us out. Uh, if you'd like to continue supporting these programs, also consider a membership. Memberships are the best way to support us. You give a little bit each year uh, and it helps us to keep the lights on. It helps us to do uh, programming like this. Uh, it helps to keep professionals and experts like John and I working for this organization. Uh, so make sure to consider both of those options, the annual appeal to restore the ambulance wagon uh, or the uh, membership uh, for ongoing support. Uh, either one would be a huge help to us. We are a private nonprofit. Your gifts are tax deductible. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's my pitch. Uh, John, is there uh, anything else uh, we need? Any more housework we should do before we get going? Uh, just uh, shouting some people out in the comments. Uh, we have uh, Michael watching all the way from the Czech Republic. Um, oh, <laughs> always fun to to take this into uh, international waters. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> to use a, a, a naval term here. Uh, Bill uh, watching says, Happy New Year, go Navy. Um, so that's uh, exciting. David uh, from Forestville uh, and Jan from Orlando, Florida, John McFarland from Lakeland, Florida. So we got a number of, uh, of people uh, eagerly watching with us today and it's great to, to be with all of you. Uh, so to dive into our topic of conversation uh, here today, and I should note if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the comments and uh, we'll work to uh, get to as many as we can. Uh, oh, and I, I should say, um, I can't see the comments. Uh, John is, is administering here. So uh, when the comments pop up, he'll try to bring them to me uh, as, as we go. Yes. Um, so Kyle, uh, and I see you're wearing your, your very kind of combo festive slash yeah. uh, seaside sweater. Um, you are an <laughs> avid, someone that's avidly interested in naval history. How did you come to uh, Civil War slash naval history? What's your, your background there? Uh, well, all the way back in grade school, uh, I think it was fifth grade, um, our tiny little town up in the mountains, uh, this is in California, Sierra Nevadas, uh, we drove down to San Diego, uh, which is a major naval base. Uh, and there they have the Maritime Museum of San Diego. It's a collection of ships. Uh, the entire museum's afloat, uh, except for the ticket booth, which is this old pilot house that sits on the sidewalk. Uh, and they've got like a, a steam ferry there. They have a steam yacht. Um, and they, their big flagship is the Star of India. She was built in 1863, um, arguably the oldest active ship afloat. She sails every year under her own power. Uh, she's an iron vessel that was built on the Isle of Man. Uh, and in response to the Civil War, actually, they were trying to get cotton from India. Uh, and this ship hosts overnights for school groups. You stay the night, you pretend to be a sailor, uh, you, you learn knots, you haul up barrels, you raise sails, you push around the capstan, you do all that stuff. And you're there for like 18 hours. It's a pretty intense experience. Um, had a great time, fell in love with it, even as a kid. Uh, and then when I was 18 years old and I left high school, they hired me to do those overnights. Uh, and I started working and that's how I started my museum career was, was on these ships. Uh, and I was there for seven years. Uh, I opened the gates to the surprise when the museum uh, acquired that. I was the one who was uh, working the tickets there. Um, I did interpretation of all different periods. Uh, never quite made the jump from educator to actual sailor, uh, but I learned a lot of sailor stuff. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was the boat nerd. Uh, and uh, I, I've kind of stuck with that. Uh, I now have a website that I very infrequently update now uh, called British Tars 1740 to 1790. Uh, it's a social history that examines the lives of common British sailors in the uh, 1700s. Uh, so I'm, I'm a total boat nerd, have been for a long time. I've got an octant on my uh, hearth over here. Uh, and uh, it was kind of natural uh, also as a a uh, nerdy history guy growing up in the 90s that you'd fall into the Civil War. That was like the big thing in popular history. Uh, and so those two kind of came together uh, from different tracks. And that's that's how I got interested. There you go. You, you might not be a sailor, but you're, uh, you're officially sailor adjacent, <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> Uh, that's great. I, I actually didn't know that story. I, that's that's really fun, especially that you know you got to have that experience uh, on the on the ship, and then you got to come back and provide that uh, same experience uh, for others. That's yeah, really uh, fun. I love that. I, I was later told that our school group, when I came in in whatever grade it was, um, that we were like the second or third group to ever stay the night on that ship. So it was from the the get go. Uh, I just I got lucky. My sister didn't get to go. She's only one year older than me, uh, but I did, and here I am. <laughs> Wow, man, who knows how, how your sister's life could have changed as well. <laughs> Maybe it's for the best, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, splendid. So, uh, so that's how, uh, how Kyle uh, comes to this topic. Uh, and the kind of the big premise here talking about uh, Navy, uh, US Navy and Marine casualties during the Civil War is that um, Marines and sailors were less likely to die of disease um, or, or in combat than their U.S. Army counterparts in terms of, you know, percentages, um, you know, but they delivered, you know, such a, uh, they were such a critical part 
of the Union victory between the blockade and and other uh, activities. So you were kind of taking a close look at you know why the casualties were so skewed and and why those ratios weren't as high. So um, maybe talk about uh, some of those percentages in terms of total people who served in the army and the navy and what percentage were casualties and died of disease and all that. Sure. So uh, start there. Yeah, uh, I think rather than throwing a bunch of numbers at you, I'll just share my screen here. Um, this shows all of it. Uh, and right off the bat, you can see that the Navy is uh, not suffering the same number of deaths as the Army is, either in combat or from disease. Um, it's pretty easy to explain the battle part. The disease part is a little more interesting. Uh, only a third as many, less than a third, uh, as many sailors and Marines died of disease as did in the army. And it's not like this is a, um, this is a clean service. There are some advantages that they have, water especially, because it's mostly a steam fleet at this point, uh, they're able to use the steam, uh, the water produced by the steam engines. Uh, and that sort of um, cleans it. It's like boiling the water. It's literally boiling the water. Uh, so the water that you have on board is more clean than you would get in a camp. But that shouldn't account for this much of a difference. Um, there's a lot of speculation on exactly why this is. Most likely it comes down to demographics. Uh, sailors and soldiers have uh, very little in common with each other, uh, broadly speaking. Um, so soldiers are mostly coming from rural communities. Uh, many of them have an agricultural background, whereas uh, sailors and Marines tend to come from urban areas. Um, often this is a place that they've lived their entire lives. They're more likely to be exposed to diseases in childhood that would grant them immunity. Uh, that makes a big difference uh, and, and probably accounts for a significant uh, change uh, between these two death rates by disease. Uh, another one is the surgeons themselves. Navy surgeons were far more likely to be qualified early in the war. Um, they are actually undergoing boards of examination, uh, which is not true for many of the surgeons in, in the U.S. Army at the beginning of the war. Uh, the U.S. Army did require it for federal units, those that are regulars, those that are professional soldiers. If you're on the frontier at the beginning of the Civil War, you're almost certainly a regular soldier. And your surgeon is subject to testing, uh, not only to be admitted at all, uh, but also ongoing. If there is an accusation of malpractice, they have to prove that they didn't do that. Uh, that's not really true for the first couple of years of the war for the army because they expand to volunteer units. And that makes up 97% of the army. Uh, and those are not subject to the same kind of requirements. Uh, especially in the first year of the war, you're seeing this all over the place. I have an ancestor who was admitted as a, a corporal in the army at 50 years old uh, because he was in a militia unit before the war and they just folded that militia unit in. Uh, he was probably wildly unqualified, but he, he was able to get in because that's how loosey-goosey it was for the volunteer units. That was never true for the Navy. There's no such thing in the Civil War as a volunteer Navy vessel. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist. Surgeons are all subject to examinations to get in at all, uh, and if they're accused of malpractice. Malpractice is very rare uh, among surgeons in the Navy. Um, I think there's only one case that was identified by uh, Terry Reimer in her uh, very entertaining book, Bad Doctors. Uh, it's a breakdown of all of the um, uh, cases of court martial of surgeons that could be found, uh, much more extensive for the North. But uh, in the Navy, there's not too many surgeons that are brought up on court martial. Only one of them is brought up on malpractice. The others, it's mostly drinking. Uh, so this is a big difference in disease uh, between these two forces, uh, the background that they're coming from and the qualifications of the surgeon. Um, but again, that's not to say that the uh, ships themselves are necessarily cleaner. Uh, I love this image. This is by uh, C. Ellery Stedman. Uh, he's a surgeon in the Navy, or was, this is 150 years ago. Uh, and he had this sketchbook. It's now in the collection of the US Army Heritage and Education Center. Uh, and it's got some great illustrations. This one was entitled, He Wishes He Joined the Army. Uh, <laughs> Naval service did come with its own stuff that the Army didn't have to deal with. Seasickness being a big one. You can see he's got that bowl there. He's ready to, to just up chuck into. Uh, there was a lot of dirty conditions, especially in the river riding forces, uh, gunboats that were going up and down the Mississippi. Uh, there's one guy who describes 
uh, pantaloons walking off the deck because it was so covered with lice. Uh, it could be a very dirty and disgusting place. They were just more likely to be immune to those diseases that they ran into. Yeah, that's uh, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff to, to unpack there. Uh, first of all, um, worth noting the, the percentages uh, because of course the, the total number of people in the army dramatically uh, out, you know, outnumbers the, uh, the, those in the Navy and Marines. Um, so that, that's why we're, we're using percentages and, and the percentages right. are revealing some interesting things along the lines of what you just said. Um, so just, I mean, it's, it's there, but I just wanted to underscore that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also important to note that we're talking about the United States here, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being, and the most important, I think, uh, in the words of James McPherson, uh, these are very asymmetrical forces that are fighting each other when it comes to Confederate and Union forces uh, at sea, uh, afloat. Um, the Confederate Navy is tiny. It is very small throughout this conflict. I was telling John yesterday that the uh, Confederate Naval Hospitals took in more patients than there were sailors and Marines in the Confederacy. Uh, they had an infrastructure, they just didn't have the actual force. Not to say that there was no Navy, there absolutely was, but it was very small compared to the United States Navy. Uh, it was a minuscule force. And when you're comparing it to the size of the Confederate Army, it's even smaller. Um, Oftentimes throughout the Civil War, uh, the Union and Confederacy are facing off at roughly equal odds. Uh, sometimes you have one force outnumbering the other, and usually that's the United States. But it's, not, it's usually not as asymmetrical as you have in the Navy. The United States Navy absolutely dwarfs the Confederate Navy. Uh, and that's one reason we're talking about that, is that it's just a much more significant organization and makes the comparison a little less uh, problematic. The other thing is we have the records. Confederate naval records burned. I mean, that's just, that's the way it is. We don't have as much information on them. Uh, so that's why I chose to focus on this. Hopefully someday we can go back and, and find some more stuff. Um, but uh, for now, we're gonna be talking about forces of the United States. Yes, great, great clarifying point there. Um, and, and the other thing that, I mean, it, it shouldn't have surprised me. And I think I'm, uh, on one level, I'm sure I knew this, but how, you know, there were, there were no volunteer uh, you know, naval vessels, you know, it's all, you know, the, the regular, well, not the regular army, but the regular Navy. Uh, I mean, I, I would think that, you know, probably because there's a little bit more know-how that goes into running a ship. I mean, you can go from being a farmer to being a soldier, uh, you know, with some guidance, but it, you know, it's, it's, you kind of get the gist of what's supposed to go on, but um, to go from a farmer to being a sailor, that's like a totally different skill set. Is that, is that really, you know, have something to do with it? has something to do with it. Um, the Navy didn't want too many uh, landsmen. Landsmen are those that don't have experience with sailing. There's only a certain percentage that you can have on any given vessel before it becomes a problem, before your ship is actually in danger because your crew is so inexperienced. Um, but uh, I think a bigger one though is the cost. It is so expensive to build and man and arm and supply these boats. It is incredibly expensive to do so. A rich guy can throw together a company uh, and he can become a captain at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, there's no chance that a rich guy uh, in 1860s United States or Confederacy can buy an ironclad. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so... And then also to have the infrastructure to support that is, is phenomenally expensive. Uh, so it's just not that realistic. The sailors themselves are volunteers, generally speaking, they, they choose to join. Um, but uh, the ships themselves have to be supplied by a massive infrastructure and they are very expensive. Uh, so that's, that's a big reason for there being no real volunteer in the United States. There are uh, state navies at the beginning of the Civil War within the Confederacy. This is taking on the tradition of the Continental Navy uh, in the American Revolution. Uh, they had many different navies for all the different colonies, some of which were very small and insignificant. Others were actually kind of sizable. Uh, this was matched with privateers. Uh, and then they also had their central uh, Continental Fleet. And this is kind of how it works for the Confederacy. The United States is very federal, it's very organized, it's very centralized. The Confederacy is a little bit more loosey-goosey. There's, especially the beginning of the war, a bunch of state fleets, uh, and then the central Confederate fleet, and then privateers beyond that. Gotcha. 
Uh, just popping over the comments quickly, we got a number of good questions. We'll, we'll tackle Sorry. as many as we can um, today. Uh, Jan asks, and I think especially in relation to kind of maybe some of the disease rates, how many days did naval personnel stay on, on, uh, on board ships versus on land? It depended, but a very long time. Generally speaking, um, sailors were on these boats for uh, almost the duration. Uh, the USS Wyoming, for example, was uh, dispatched to the Far East, uh, to, the, to Eastern Asia uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, or a little bit later in the Civil War, because there were some false uh, ideas that the Raider Alabama was in Pacific waters, uh, and she was on a three-year cruise. So the men were expected to be on this vessel with very few breaks uh, for three straight years. Um, if you were on a blockading vessel, you were more likely to actually get to shore every now and then, but you were still there for a very long time, months on end. Uh, this often was a very inactive period. Uh, there's lots of jokes about sailors getting fat uh, around this period because they're just sitting on these boats trying to stop vessels from coming in and out. Uh, if you were at a very active port, Maybe you were you were shimmying back and forth as you're chasing raiders, especially at, or um, uh, not raiders, blockade runners, uh, especially at night. But if you're on a uh, a important blockade duty, but there's not a lot of, of runners coming in and out, you're just sitting there uh, for a very long time. So yes, they're sitting around a lot. Gotcha. Uh, and I'll, I'll also pass on uh, Gary's comment. He says, please capitalize Marine, Semper Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, so. that's fair. Uh, I am using the convention of the period uh, in which it was usually not capitalized, but we are talking about the 1860s too. So it could go either way. Uh, yeah, I can, I can um, capitalize that in the future. Just wanted to officially register his. Uh, <laughs> his yes, his and that's fair. Let's see, uh, Lynn asks in the, uh, in the records, can the numbers of deaths by disease be broken down into cholera and typhus uh, and, and you know the individual diseases? Man, I wish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from the sources we have, uh, no, not really. Um, it, I think that we can eventually get to that. It's gonna require some work on my part to um, go into the records and parse them out. From the sources that I'm using, um, they do not list by disease, uh, but I, I think that would be very telling. I think that could tell us what diseases specifically sailors might be more um, susceptible to, or soldiers might be more susceptible to, um, both from immunity and from cramped conditions. Uh, so I think that would be very illustrative. I just, I have not done that yet. Got it. Uh, and then quickly here, uh, Rick asks, uh, about a, um, a good Civil War medicine slash medical book um, do we recommend for a, a great read? Uh, I would recommend, uh, it's a book we sell in our, our gift shop and I believe in our online store as well. It's called Blood and Germs uh, by Gail Jarrow. We actually interviewed her uh, on uh, both the Facebook page and on YouTube. Uh, about this time last year, actually, Ooh. right around when it came out. It's a great overview of the history of Civil War medicine. Uh, it doesn't explain everything um, there is to, to know by any means, but it's a great, great way to get started if you're interested in learning more. Uh, do you have a, a favorite Civil War medicine book, Kyle? Uh, I was going to say that's a good one. Um, if you're looking for Navy stuff specifically, there's there's not a lot out there that's specifically about the um, the Navy or the Marines. Um, but I do recommend the C. Ellery Stedman book. Uh, the same guy that I mentioned did this illustration. Uh, his journal was converted into a book. Uh, it was transcribed. Uh, it's out of print now, but you can still find it pretty easily. They made a lot of them. Um, and uh, it's full of these, these hilarious little illustrations and his experiences day to day. Uh, it's a contrast to the book that you recommended, which is a, a general history. Um, this one is a personal narrative within that. I think if you combine those two things, it's kind of a fun, um, fun way to, to introduce yourself to the story of Civil War medicine. Yeah, that's great. A, a kind of general overview and then one specific boots on the ground account. That's, that's great. Um, also, uh, I meant to 
to shout this out earlier, but uh, Daniel Nolan says, uh, you're the guy behind British TARS. I love that site. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I update very infrequently now. I think it's been about a year since I did the last one. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff in there, uh, if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, BritishTARS.com. Check it out. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching. Uh, and again, a lot of great questions here. Uh, we'll we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, I wonder, Kyle, if you could go back to the statistics here. Just to, I'm going to ask a question kind of related to these here. Uh, why were Marines and sailors twice as likely to be killed than wounded, uh, or while soldiers on land were twice as likely to be wounded than killed? Or well, according to these statistics, yeah, it's uh, not quite twice, but uh, but it is it is more likely uh, to to be killed in combat than to be uh, wounded uh, as a as a, uh, a sailor or a marine in the Civil War. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. The Civil War, and I, I say this on a lot of our videos, the Civil War is a period of transition. Uh, it's a period of transition technologically, uh, uh, politically. Uh, there's a lot of different things that are happening. And this means that there's this weird combination of new and old that's happening all at once in the Civil War. There are muskets and machine guns. Uh, it's, it's just such a crazy period. And you see this uh, illustrated in the naval conflict. There's a metaphorical moment where the age of sail ends in the Civil War. And that's what's being portrayed here uh, in this uh, lithograph from the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Uh, speaking of capitalization, I should have capitalized department here too. I'm just having a bad grammar day. Um, yeah, <laughs> what we're seeing here is the USS Cumberland being uh, sunk, rammed and sunk by this the CSS Virginia, the Merrimack. So this is the famous Battle of Hampton Roads. It's the day before the Monitor shows up. Uh, the Virginia, when she first came out to the Battle of Hampton Roads, she knew there was one vessel that could give her a uh, fight. Uh, an actual danger. And that was the Cumberland because she had the biggest guns. If anybody was going to be able to penetrate her armor, it was going to be the Cumberland. The Cumberland is also the last sail frigate in the U.S. Navy. There is no steam aboard this vessel. Uh, it's at anchor. Uh, and we have the first ironclad sinking the last sail ship. It's this moment that's kind of like the Titanic. It's so metaphorical, it feels made up. Uh, but it is at this moment that sail is dead, uh, that this is the very end. Uh, there's not even a pretense of sail to the Virginia. Most steam vessels in this period are a combination of sail and steam. That continues to be true for decades. Uh, but the Virginia is not one. She does not have any sails. She has no spars, no masts. She's got a steam stack, and that's it. Uh, and this heralds a completely different kind of naval warfare because prior to uh, the age of iron uh, and prior to long ranging guns at the uh, heroic age of sail, we're talking uh, Nelson, John Paul Jones, all the famous you know guys with tricorn hats who are stabbing each other on ships. Uh, you're trying to capture enemy vessels. Again, vessels are very expensive. Only nations can bring out fleets of warships. Uh, and if you capture them, you not only draw from your enemy, you make yourself more powerful. Uh, but when we get to this era, uh, with the rise of iron, with the rise of steam, with the rise of long ranging accurate guns, um, it changes. You're no longer trying to capture vessels, you're trying to sink them. You are trying to destroy those ships. Uh, it's a much more deadly type of combat. And that's not to say that it wasn't deadly before, because the other factor is for all of naval history, um, well, at least uh, pre-modern naval history, when they have cannons, uh, you are using cannons as your main form of combat. Uh, you're not picking people off. You're not choosing your targets. You are throwing lead, giant balls of iron across at each other. Uh, it's impersonal uh, and it's indiscriminate. This makes for a very deadly type of combat anyway, regardless of whether you're trying to sink the ship or not. But these iron vessels, uh, they sort of necessitate sinking each other. They're much harder to board. Uh, they're much harder to seize. You got to hope they run aground uh, and then you can go get them. Uh, or if you're riverine combat where the shores are rather close, uh, which is where most ironclads operate, you might have a chance of seizing that vessel. But these are also very heavy vessels. 
when the um, USS Keokuk, uh, I think it's the USS Keokuk, uh, strikes a mine at the um, Battle of Mobile Bay, she sank in seconds, took almost her entire crew down with her. I think there were two survivors uh, out of a crew of like 150 or something. Um, again, those numbers are rough and they, they may not be, but it's something like that, where just the, the chance of survival was so low. These vessels are very heavy and they do not have watertight compartments. They go straight to the bottom. Uh, so this is a very deadly era of naval combat. It's a turning point. Uh, it's indiscriminate, which naval combat always had been, uh, but it's also, um, it's, you're not trying to seize vessels anymore. Crews are much more likely to go to the bottom. Right, which leads to this high rate of death versus wounding, whereas, you know, the and, and even just thinking about the relative size of the ammunition, you know, a, a bullet is, you know, the, the size of, you know, maybe the tip of your index finger or something like that. Whereas the, the smallest bit of ammunition getting thrown around on a naval battlefield is like the size of your head. Um, yes. So just like just the size of ammunition, if you get struck by something, uh, it's probably going to be a lot bigger in naval combat than uh, than on land, which of course makes you more likely to lose a limb or or worse. Um, yeah, and so. you know a single shot can do a lot, uh, especially because they are transitioning to steam. The steam engines themselves are a danger. If you puncture a steam boiler, it releases scalding steam into the compartment. Uh, if you breathe that in, it will burn you inside out. Uh, and this does happen occasionally. The USS Keystone State, uh, which is a, a blockade chaser, um, she's chasing down a blockade runner. The blockade runner gets off one lucky shot, pierces the drum, and kills like eight people. Uh, it's just right away. That's what happens. That included the surgeon and the surgeon's steward. Uh, this is an indiscriminate uh, type of combat uh, where you're using only uh, big, or not only, but mostly big ball rounds or shells. Uh, it's very deadly and, and um, uh, quite frightening. So you can see why those casualties are imbalanced. Uh, if you're ex especially unlucky, uh, you can cause the uh, steam engine to explode. Uh, and this, this does happen throughout the conflict. Whole ships will just go up. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a different type of combat experience. And the casualties seem to, uh, I think, in, in naval combat kind of come in way like, you know, batches as opposed to um, uh, on land, it's sort of a, a steady stream uh, of casualties uh, in, in battle. Yeah, and, and uh, a lot of that too is because there's not that much fighting. I mean, when we see the casualties here, uh, we can see that there are more deaths than there are wounds uh, in, in uh, naval combat. But when you compare those numbers to the deaths and wounds for the army, it's no comparison. It's, it's 25% uh, of what the, the army is experiencing among their enlisted. Uh, there's not fighting that often. It's just when they do, they're fighting artillery. They're fighting shore batteries, they're fighting forts, they're fighting other vessels, sometimes ironclads, which uh, wooden vessels have very little chance against. Uh, so you're, you're not as likely to see combat as a sailor or a Marine, but if you do, it's gonna be more deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of along those lines, we have a, a question from Jan here. Uh, was there any onboard uh, form of triage? So uh, basically, you know, anytime there's any sort of combat, the odds are, I would think there's going to be multiple casualties, you know, in a single batch. Um, was there any sort of official triage there in, in naval settings? Uh, yes and no. Uh, what we're seeing here, uh, it's another uh, C. Ellery Stedman sketch. Uh, this is the cockpit. This is where um, naval surgery is happening. It's different on different vessels. Uh, this one appears to be in the um, officer's area. Uh, you can see it looks a little nicer on the walls. Uh, the beams overhead suggest that this is not um, too far below decks. Uh, this, this may be sort of higher up. Um, this is where surgery takes place. Uh, sur surgery happens as the battle is ongoing. Uh, it, it's something that you've got to do while it's happening. You've got to get the wounded out of the way of the guns, of people moving ammunition. Uh, you, you've got to get them somewhere. And, and it makes sense that the surgeon would do this while fighting is happening. The surgeon isn't going to be fighting. Um, the triage that would happen 
uh, is a little more hectic and unofficial than it is for the army. The army has the benefit of having distance to work with. Uh, that means that you get wounded to a field dressing station. They are assessed and first aid is administered by an assistant surgeon and a hospital steward, uh, and then they're sent back. In the Navy, uh, the casualties are coming in constantly and they're coming in to the place of operation. Uh, it's not just first aid, it's everything. And it's all happening in the same spot. Uh, so a degree of it is who is getting there first. But the surgeon is also going to make the call. He's going to say, okay, your arm is, is you know, the forearm is lacerated. We're going to bandage that up. But the, the surgeon steward can take care of that. I got to work on this other guy who has a splinter sticking out of his chest. Uh, so they're making sort of an unofficial triage as they're going, but it is much more hectic. Everything is happening all in one place all at once. Uh, and so they're going to have to just make those, those uh, decisions on the fly to an extent. Yeah, that's something I hadn't considered before, um, because by the nature of, you know, some time needed to pass in order to get all the casualties off the field, the hospital is by necessity on the, you know, the field, quote unquote, on a, right. on a boat, on a ship. Um, so it's just all happening. Yeah, that I hadn't thought much about that. That's really interesting. Um, we got, a, a, again, a number of great questions in the comments here. Um, Let's see, uh, David says, I have found memoirs by Union and Confederate Army surgeons, but nothing by naval surgeons. Uh, do you have, know of any naval surgeon memoirs, Kyle? Yeah, uh, the one I mentioned earlier, the guy who was doing these sketches, uh, C. Ellery Stedman, his is one of the easiest to find. Um, there's, uh, shoot, I was just looking at one the other day, the Naval History and Heritage Foundation, uh, they have some stuff that's just online that you can just download. Uh, it, their website is sometimes a little bit difficult to traverse, but they've got a ton of stuff there. Uh, fantastic works. Um, and uh, some of those are just word searchable. You can download them, you can read them. Um, others are freely available in um, archives. So I'm about to go, I've, I'm making an appointment to go down and, and see it uh, at the US Navy Academy in um, Annapolis. Um, I've done research there before. They're very friendly. They've got a lot of great stuff. Um, I was just telling John about this the other day. One of my current projects uh, for our blog is the Battle of Shimonoseki Straits, uh, where the USS Wyoming fought um, the uh, Japanese forces. That's kind of an oversimplification, um, but Japanese forces in 1863. Uh, and the surgeon, Edwin R. Denby, his diary is in their collection. It's the original, uh, not even a transcript, the real thing. Uh, and you can just go there and uh, examine it in that room. Um, so there, there are some that are published, like Stedman. There are some that are free, freely available online, like the Naval History and Heritage Foundation. And there are some that you've got to go to uh, specific archives for. Uh, but they're all over the place. They, they do exist. Splendid. Um, our, uh, one of our longtime viewers and volunteers and members, uh, John Willen, asks... Uh, hey! Was was there a difference in disease uh, incidents and mortality between naval and army surgeons? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, leave a... it to John. You're always going to bring up the question that I haven't thought of. Exactly. <laughs> I, I have not done the research on that. Uh, I, I wish that I had, uh, but I, I just haven't done that work. So now I've got to hit the books. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch about that, John. Um, Vanessa asks, uh, what was the number of uh, black sailors aboard during this time? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I'll kick it to Kyle in a second, but we did a, a, a larger video on this subject with uh, Brad, uh, I believe on our YouTube channel about uh, African-American sailors in the Civil War. Um, so if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find a, a longer discussion on that subject there, but I'll, I'll kick it to Kyle here to speak to that now. Yeah. Um... The percentage is, is quite different from that in the army. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So the largest minority uh, in the army, uh, if you want to call it that, is uh, German. Uh, Germans make up the, the largest uh, percentage of an ethnic group within the army. In the Navy, it is African-Americans. Uh, it's black sailors. And it's 20%. Uh, I think by the end of the war, 10% of the army is um, USCT, United States Colored Troops. In the Navy, it's 20%. It's twice as much. 
uh, again, by percentage, and we're talking very different scales here. The Navy is much smaller than the Army. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that many of these gunboats uh, that are uh, on river iron operations, uh, in Mississippi especially, but elsewhere, uh, are the first Union forces to reach plantations. Uh, and that means that they have their pick. Uh, another reason is that there is a long history of black seamanship uh, in uh, going way back to the beginning of the colonies. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Um, I recommend the book Black Jacks. Uh, it's a history of um, black sailors uh, in early, from the early days of the colonies uh, through the American Revolution into the um, early federal period and, and 19th century. Um, great book, covers a lot of bases. Uh, I learned things there and uh, I was at the time uh, doing research on the transatlantic slave trade and was getting records from both sides of the continent of the uh, Atlantic. I uh, actually got UNESCO designation for my last museum as a site of remembrance on the slave trade. Um, so I was like really neck deep in this stuff. And I read this popular history and it still revealed things to me. Uh, it's a great book, definitely recommend it. Blackjacks, check it out. Um, but uh, that long tradition of um, skilled mariners uh, was, was creating a pool from which the United States Navy could draw. Very cool. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fascinating read. I think I might take a, take a look into that. Um, we've talked a little bit about the kind of combat experience of what medical care was like on board a ship. Um, but what was, uh, what was the experience of medical care like uh, when there wasn't a battle raging or if, or if you got sick? Uh, what was that like? It actually wasn't too different from that in the army, uh, except that your surgeon was more likely to know what he was doing. Uh, <laughs> at least for the first couple of years of the war. I don't want to throw everybody under the bus. Uh, like I said, there's a big difference uh, from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. But the Navy always had boards of examination. Uh, some of these survive uh, and surgeons would have to do things like explain the symptoms of a pregnancy, the uh, identify a medicine from its Latin name and what its uses were. Uh, you really did have to prove you knew what you were doing. Uh, so they had very good surgeons uh, throughout the conflict, uh, again, broadly speaking. Uh, and these surgeons would have something akin to a sick call. Uh, from what I understand, uh, and I have not done a lot of research on the day-to-day, hour-by-hour routine of a ship, my understanding, though, is that um, the sick call was not usually a fixed time. Uh, it was more like a sailor would be referred. Um, this may have been in part to prevent uh, epidemic spread uh, or pandemic spread, uh, depending on which waters you were in, uh, because these are very cramped and confined quarters. Uh, the Navy was well aware that a ship could be completely immobilized if a disease started to really spread. So they were very much, we need to nip this in the bud. Uh, in the Army, you, you know, you're always moving around. You could send a guy off to hospital. Navy doesn't really have that option. If you're on a ship and you're in blue water service, you're away from shore, you could be away from, from your home base for years uh, and you need to get on top of it. They would have very large supplies uh, compared to their army counterparts of medicines and surgical tools. One example of this that we saw at the uh, National Museum of Health and Medicine uh, was that Navy surgical kits were much more extensive than their army counterparts. Um, one that the curator pointed out to us was the Trophine. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, one of my favorite movies, uh, there's a scene where um, the uh, swelling of the brain causes one of the patients uh, to, to have um, pressure against the skull. Uh, this can be very bad. Uh, so one of the oldest, uh, perhaps the oldest surgical technique is trephination. You cut a hole in the skull to allow the pressure to, to seep out. Uh, and that is still practiced to this day, uh, although not commonly, it's not that common of a condition. Uh, and in the Civil War for the Army, there were only 240 cases of trepanation. We're talking about a war that had 600,000, 720,000 casualties, and 240 operations were for trepanation. It's a pretty rare technique, uh, but every Navy surgical kit had a trephine. Because if you're at sea, if you're away from shore, you cannot just go back and ask somebody for something. Uh, so that's true of their, um, of their pharmaceutical stores too. They tend to be more extensive than what a regimental surgeon would carry with him. You can't just send back for it. You have to have it on hand. Uh, so that's one major difference between medical treatment uh, at sea and ashore. 
that makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, not everything is as uh, as widely available. And speaking about um, you know the ability to you know you can't just pop back over and get some. Uh, Marsha asks, um, what was the food like, uh, spoiled or fresh? <laughs> uh, neither. Uh, it was much <laughs> like the RB, a lot of it was dried and desiccated. Uh, this is, however, the era of canning. Uh, they are very much into canning. Uh, they're using it all the time. Uh, so you are getting um, preserved items, but they're not necessarily desiccated or dried out or salted. Uh, they are getting plenty of salt pork. They're getting a lot of hard tech, uh, but they are also using cans quite often. If you're an officer, uh, you're more likely to have some nice stuff. Uh, officers were uh, able to keep their own liquor stores uh, that they could stock up before uh, going to sea. And that was also true of food. Uh, they could keep their own stores of food. They were more likely to get um, fresh food or fresher food. Um, they also kept on board in a space called the menagerie uh, a certain number of animals. Goats uh, were, were especially uh, useful because they're smaller, they produce milk, and when they stop producing milk, then they become meat. Uh, there's some chickens, uh, again, same reason you can get, they're, they're pretty, uh, isolated. You can keep them together, uh, and you can get eggs out of that as well as the meat once they stop producing eggs. Uh, so they, they do have some fresh stores on board. Um, and, uh, the officers especially got some pretty good stuff. Yes, it, uh, it pays to be an officer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> literally and, uh, and figuratively, of course. Uh, and, and speaking of pay, actually. Uh, Barbara asks, were sailors paid more, less, or the same as soldiers? That's something I should know the answer to, and I don't. Uh, <laughs> I know that bounties were a big deal. Um, so prior to this, uh, in the heroic age of sail, sailors were not paid as well as soldiers. Uh, so 18th century, early 19th century, you did not make as much money. The trade-off to that was prize money. If you seized an enemy vessel, it would be sold at auction, and you would get a share of that profit. Um, one of the most exceptional uh, circumstances of this was uh, back in the 1740s, uh, there was a, an expedition around the world by the British Navy to try and fight the Spanish, and they captured a Spanish galleon. Uh, the Spanish galleons carried the wealth of the Spanish empire uh, from Asia to the New World and then over to Spain itself, and they were richly laden. Uh, this capture by a, a vessel uh, made every single one of them phenomenally rich. Now it was playing the lottery and it was a justification for paying less to these sailors. By the Civil War, that's no longer an option. Like I said, most of these ships are going to the bottom, but they do still have prize courts. And this is especially useful for those sailors on blockade duty. If you seize a blockade runner, especially when she's coming back, uh, they will still sell that vessel uh, or take it into the Navy, and then the Navy still pays out the, to the uh, sailors and officers for it, and Marines. Uh, Marines were entitled to it as well. Um, and they would sell all the stores on board. If it's an outward bound vessel, she's probably just carrying cotton. And uh, especially by the end of the war, there's a ton of that uh, up in the north, and you're not going to sell it for very much. But if she's inward bound, she could be carrying medicine, uh, luxury items, whatever that sells for, you get a cut. Uh, so uh, the, I don't know the exact pay rates of sailors and soldiers, uh, but there was that added incentive, uh, fleeting and not that likely, of getting some prize money too. Sure. Um, Marsha uh, asked, and this is uh, something that I really uh, don't know much about, uh, why are ships always called she? <laughs> uh, it's there's a lot of explanations for it. You'll see memes about it online, uh, and this is something that I heard back at the Maritime Museum in San Diego when I worked there um, about like, oh, it's because they care so much for her. Uh, it's you know, this is a way that we approach it. And those are those are posts uh, uh, calling it uh, a she uh, justifications. Uh, the truth is that it goes back to the original name that was used, I think, in Latin. Uh, although, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Latin. Um, and that name had a um, feminine marker to it, kind of in the same way that like Spanish, uh, there's uh, a feminine and a masculine form of, of words, uh, and like a bridge has a, a feminine or masculine name to it. Uh, so it was the same thing. Uh, it was passed down into English, uh, and a ship was a feminine word. 
Uh, and so it just kind of kept going that way through through common usage. Uh, and that's why uh, it's, it's called that. It's an etymological thing. Got it. Uh, Andy asks, uh, with Marines and sailors uh, occasionally fighting in land battles, like at Fort Fisher, um, was there a significant percentage of deaths or wounds from combat on land in the uh, statistics you shared, Kyle? Yes. Yes, there was. Um, my my there guess is that it's probably a, a fairly small number, though, I would think. Yeah, again, we're not dealing with big numbers anyway. Uh, yeah. Again, the Navy is not that big compared to the Army. I think overall casualties uh, for the Navy and the Marine Corps in the Civil War is less than 3,000. Um, and that sounds like a lot, uh, and it is. Uh, but compared to the casualties of the army, we're not talking big numbers here. Uh, however, there were many raids ashore. Uh, sometimes this was on salt factories. They produced salt along the coast, and that was necessary for preserving food, we mentioned uh, earlier, especially for the army. Um, you had raids on ports, uh, and the big one, the one that uh, everybody remembers, is Fort Fisher. Uh, Fort Fisher was one of the last major battles of the war. Uh, it was a blockade of the last major port for blockade runners uh, in the Confederacy. Uh, and there was going to be a land assault. They bombarded it with ships uh, and they were going to attack it on land. And most of that was the army, but the Navy wanted to have their glorious rush as well. Uh, and they put together a land force of sailors, Marines and officers. Uh, and this is actually where um, one of the uh, Naval surgeons was killed uh, on the assault on this fort. Uh, the timing didn't go off quite right. The Navy was supposed to be a diversionary force. The Marines were well equipped. They had bayonets, they had rifles, but many of the sailors had cutlasses and revolvers. Uh, they were running up against earthworks with cannon uh, and they, they were hit real hard. Uh, they took significant casualties there. Um, it did work as a diversion, um, but largely because the army hadn't even started by the time they started their advance. Uh, and so when the soldiers showed up, uh, the, the fort surrendered, basically. There was still some fighting, um, but the Navy did take significant casualties at the Battle of Fort Fisher. Uh, numerous medals of honor were awarded uh, during that fight uh, to some of the sailors and, and uh, officers who, and Marines who survived. Got it. Uh, well, uh, there's several questions that, you know, we, we just don't quite have the time to, to get to today. We're coming to the end of uh, our, our time here. Um, we hope you all you know, enjoyed the video today. Um, uh, I know I had a good time. Uh, Kyle, thank you for, for joining us today. Yeah, happy to. This is a lot of fun. And uh, we'll be uh, back before you know it. Um, our next video will be... Um, featuring uh, our very own uh, Tracy McIntyre uh, and uh, with special guest uh, Audrey uh, talking about women soldiers in the Civil War. So uh, that should be coming your way uh, late next week. Uh, so get excited about that. Um, in the meantime, everyone have a, a nice weekend. Again, if you like this video and all of our videos, an easy free way to support us is to uh, like the video, share the video, uh, tell, you know, tell your friends about the video and all that good stuff. Um, and if you wanna take your support uh, up a, a level, consider uh, donating to our campaign to uh, repair and restore uh, our reproduction Civil War ambulance. Help keep our ambulance rolling as it were. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much uh, to everyone for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Good to, to have all your questions. Thanks, everybody.